You know what, you know what joy hit me? I, I talked about this with Pastor Todd a couple weeks ago. I was coming into the parking lot and then I saw Carrie Long doing this to me. And I was like, whoa, she's on coffee. And then I saw Imelda, wherever she's at, she was waving at the next station. And I was like, hey. And there was two other people when I was driving, they're like, hey. And then I saw, who was it, Dorothy. She was like jumping and waving. And I was like, I got to get in on those meetings. Well, good morning. Look at all those blue shirts, amen? Okay, to the translating team, just forgive me for a minute. I just have to say this to you right now. Um, I was struggling to write this sermon. I actually talked to Pastor Todd about it. And I'll tell you why. Because in the era of the me-centric gospel where Jesus came to make you feel good, he came to take care of all your problems, we've neglected the first command that Christ even told us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And with that, you will love your neighbor as yourself. And what happens is we've learned to almost take the gospel and say, well, if I feel right, then I will serve. As long as it suits me, I will serve. And, and it's, it was almost like, uh, Lord, why do I have to talk about this topic? So he led me a whole different way to talk about it. Uh, so it's going to be awesome. And I want you to know this is going to be an encouragement. It's not going to be a rebuke or reproof. And if you take it that way, maybe you need to repent. I don't know. God knows your heart, right? I remember when I first got saved, it was like known to serve. It's just what you did, you know? If Christ truly came in and saved your soul, I want to go save other people, amen? I want to go out and do what he did for me. Uh, and, and, and how many of us love the church, the body? Amen? How many of us love the body? And it's like, holy smokes, you know, we're, we're all different. We all are different giftings and all those. And I could go down that road, but I'm not going to. I just see in this body, everybody has a need, and some of us, all of us, have something to contribute to those needs, amen? So that's why we're talking about it this morning. And how many of us actually struggle with the question, Lord, it's actually a statement, Lord, I just want to do your will. Everybody, like, I just want to do your will. I want to, at the last and the end of my days, I want to hear, well done, thou good and servant. Notice he doesn't say, well done, the good and faithful pew warmer. Or he doesn't say, well done, the good and faithful nitpicker. Or thou good and faithful, I watch from a distance and I'm just going to pray for them. You see what I'm saying? He says servant. Why? Because we are called to be those kind of people. And in all of our discourses of Christ, I mean, I've heard many sermons on Jesus, and I love sermons on Jesus, and I'll continue to preach sermons on Jesus till I die, Lord willing. But did you know that the one thing we don't talk about, we hear about a lot of his miracles and what he taught and all those things, but in his heart, he said this, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. Do you notice in all of his writings and all the things that Jesus was written about Jesus, I should say, he never says in there, I came to do miracles. Never. He didn't ever say, I came to lead. He didn't say any of that. He said, I come to be the savior of the world against your sins, and I came to serve you. And you know what you find? Where he was serving is when the miracles happened. When he was serving is when the power of God showed up. When he served is when he found his life. Amen? That's where we need to begin, is when you serve, you find that he said, those that lose their lives for my sake will. However, if you don't lose your life, you'll perish. That's what he says. And Pete was right. Are you truly emulating Jesus? And this is all in the notes. Are we emulating Christ if we're not doing the basic command of what he said to serve the body? Really? And that's really where I want to start here. And I'm going to start off also as well by saying, like Paul said, I'm not coming to you with words of persuasive wisdom. I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to hit you with scripture. And by the grace of God, we've been praying through these sermons. So hopefully your heart will be open to receive the scriptures. Amen. Not just a story or a feel good moment or all these other things. Folks, I have served where it didn't benefit me at all. 
And that's the best times I've ever had. Because guess who was benefiting me in those moments? Not man, Christ. And so sometimes we need to serve and kind of get in those areas. And we all have reasons and things like that. I just want you guys to see the heart of servanthood, the resurrection of your giftings, the resurrection with all of your heart to do what God wants you to do. We're talking about resurrecting servanthood. Some of us just need to serve. Amen? A lot of your answers will be, wow. A lot of your answers will be answered when you just give to other people. Amen? So here we go. Here we go. Let's go right away. (laughs) Buckle up, folks. Ah, What is a servant? What does it mean? What does the word servant mean? I found three definitions. Okay? The first one's basic, to serve or to wait upon. I do that as often as I can when I'm with my kids or my wife. They have needs from me. I wait on them and I serve them, right? That's what we do. My wife waits on me and serves me as well. It's kind of reciprocal. When I'm in the office, everybody knows this. I have an open door policy. You can come in and talk to me about anything you want. I'm here to serve you. And I find that the greatest leaders were the best servants. The best leaders, if we all look at Jesus Christ as a leader of men, all these other things, he was the greatest servant on earth. He was. You can't learn to lead if you've never served. You don't understand what leadership is till you understand submission. So how are we going to understand leadership? And a lot of us want these positions of leadership. We want leadership, and I'm too good to go out and serve in parking. But boy, you want to lead a Bible study. Let me tell you something. Sometimes the greatest revelations is when you're serving out in parking. I'm, just, I'm being honest. You know what, you know what joy hit me? I, I talked about this with Pastor Todd a couple weeks ago. I was coming into the parking lot and then I saw Carrie Long doing this to me. And I was like, whoa, she's on coffee. And then I saw Imelda, wherever she's at, she was waving at the next station. And I was like, hey. And there was two other people when I was driving. They're like, hey. And then I saw who was a Dorothy. She was like jumping and waving. And I was like, I got to get in on those meetings. I want some of that joy. You know what it did for me, though? It's like, man, if those folks are up doing that stuff in the heat and they have joy to see you here in the church, man, imagine what we all could do with that kind of joy where we need to serve. Imagine. If we were just to serve with our hearts, the transformation that begins in your heart and the revelation you would get by serving one another is immense. Here's another definition, to attend to anything that may serve another's interests. (laughs) But I have interests too, Lord, doesn't matter. What serves their interests, right? Here's another definition, that's a big one. Here's another one, this one's really good. One that makes painful sacrifices in compliance with the weakness or needs of others. I'm going to read that again. One that makes painful sacrifices. You hear that? Painful sacrifices in compliance with the weakness and needs of others. That's from an 1828 dictionary. They knew something back then that we're not teaching today. I promise you. Back then it wasn't about you. Here, listen, the cross was about you. After that, now you're resurrected in glory. It's not about you, it's about him now. Amen? So we need to quit preaching a false gospel. We don't do that here, but there's a false gospel going on out there that Christ came to be here and to make sure that you're comfortable and that you're good. When he says, deny yourself, deny yourself, deny yourself, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him, right? That's servanthood. That's all that is. And people say, well, that's just, you know, that just doesn't sound like fun. (laughs) Translation team, I love you. Give me one second, Sam. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a war. We're in a spiritual war. I just heard a preacher just say this, that the spiritual war that you're in is greater than a World War III. What we're facing out there is a spiritual battle for the souls and the soul of a nation of men, okay? And we are supposed to be the ones that see that spiritual warfare and act accordingly. We're called to be the front lines of the spiritual battle. We're called to be the ones that maybe sometimes when they're out there jumping and having joy, you just broke off the demonic of someone coming in here very heavy. Maybe. 
Maybe by you serving in children's ministry, it's not your morning. But man, you just got a word last night for some child in there whose parents are going through something. You're in a battle for their souls. You're in a war. And you know what? There is no draft in the things of God. You're in once you accept Christ. And you can try to tell me that the gifts don't exist and the spirit doesn't do that. Ladies and gentlemen, look at the nation now. The more we pray, the more evil gets exposed. Is it any wonder it seems like it's getting worse? No, it's because revival's coming. Amen? So what is our role in that revival? Servanthood. It's time to serve. Amen? Let's continue. Uh, Philippians 2, 1 through 8 says this. I'm going to read it slowly. I'll try anyway. Read it slowly. I know I talk fast. I hear you judgmental people. All right. (laughs) Therefore, if there's any, listen to these, listen to these statements. The word of God is so specifically written. Therefore, if any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, encouragement, consolation, if there's any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the spirit, intent on one purpose. One purpose, one mind, okay? Do nothing, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit. You know why he wrote that? Because people were doing things out of conceit and emptiness. Sometimes we do things that are just empty and conceited. We think about ourselves and watch what he says here. But with humility of mind, regard one another more important than yourselves. Scripture will reprove you more than a sermon can if you just listen to it, right? Listen to this. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest. I highlighted this. It's in bold. You see it right here. I highlighted it. Here's why. Because it is important to look on our personal interests. We do those things, right? We count the costs. We make sure we got our things covered. We make sure. But he says, do not merely only do that. But then he says, go further than that. He says, but look also on the interest of others. Now, here's the kicker. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ. He's setting it up. He's saying this attitude of serving was in Jesus already. And then he says this, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Watch. But he emptied himself. The greatest example on earth emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. You know, Jesus said something to the disciples that I think is so telling. He said, as my father has sent me, so I send He became humbled to the point of being made a servant. He was a calmly man. He was not something to behold. He wasn't any of those things. He came as a servant to all. And I'm sitting here thinking, I need to be more like Jesus, right? That's what we all want to be. We want to look like Christ. He's saying right here, he humbled himself to be a servant, right? And then he says, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Dang. That's a gauntlet for me. He became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. That's unbelievable. How many feel convicted in this room by just that statement alone? Amen? I do. That's not rhetorical. I was waiting to see some hands. I get convicted by scripture all the time. Lord, I need to be more like you. I read scripture. I'm like, I'm nothing like you. (laughs) Ah, You know, I need mercy. I'm going to go to the examples of your Savior. Jesus was the ultimate servant leader. And I just want to hear what he said. I want you to hear what he said of himself. This is Matthew 20, 26 through 28. Matthew 26, Matthew 20, 26 through 28. You guys want to write these scriptures down so you can remember these things when you don't feel like serving one day. (laughs) I don't feel like serving. Matthew 20. All right, let's play it. He says, it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Whew. Dale, you're almost like, I know this already. I serve everywhere. (laughs) 
Verse 27, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Slave meaning subservient. Verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And I want you to just, pre- I'm going to preface Matthew 20. This is when the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him and said, hey, I got these two sons. Which one wants to be on your right hand, on your left hand? That's what they want to do. And he goes, you have no idea what you're asking me for. You don't have a clue what you're, you don't realize the things they're going to have to go through to get to those positions. But then he says, that's not even my position to give. Notice what her, the heart was. I'm not saying the heart was bad. I'm saying she wanted her sons with Christ on the right and the left, right? But you know what's so crazy? Who ended up washing their feet? Jesus never said, I'm the one ascending to the right hand of the Father in a prideful way. No, he ascended because he was the Son of God and is the Son of God. And he's alive forevermore, right? But yet he was the one washing the disciples' feet after many of them forsook him. After many of them said, no, I don't know if I can grasp this. After many of them, he actually called Peter Satan because he tried to keep him from the cross. And yet it was Jesus that still washed even Judas' feet. Even Judas had his feet washed by the Son of Man. And I'm thinking to myself, how many of us hold on to bitterness for something that someone did to us and we won't serve them? When the Word of God says, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Because you belong to Christ, not the earth. Jesus was the best example of church hurt. And I'm going to go through that in a minute. The gifts were given to you by Christ to serve one another. The gifts you have, the talents you've been given, the joys that you experience, all these things were given to you so you could bless other people. Let's go through scripture again, amen? 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. Again, write this down when you don't feel like serving. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11, amen? Amen. Listen to this. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. For the purpose of what? Prayers. Servanthood all the way. All the way. Above all, keep a fervent without ceasing. That word fervent means without ceasing. Keep fervent love for one another. That means your love can't stop for one another. And it shouldn't stop. How many of us, this is rhetorical now, you don't have to raise your hands. Our love stops for people when they do something. When they don't, like Pete was saying, expectations, they don't meet our expectations, so then I limit how I serve them. Thank God Jesus doesn't do that to us. Thank God. He's, his mercy is always everlasting. They're new every morning. And you just said it, boss, I don't deserve... I put myself in the mirror of the law and the word of God and I don't deserve anything he gives me. Yet he says, get up, man, and go serve. Go. I've commanded you to do such. Right? Watch this. He says this, because love covers a multitude of sins. That word is servanthood. A serving love covers a multitude of sins. Right? Ooh, this is going to get good in a minute. It's already good, but this is fun. Right? Verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 9, be hospitable. The word hospitable means being generous to guests and a lover of guests. We have that culture here at Revive Praise Jesus. We love our guests. We love when people show up. Again, your parking team starts it, and then I get in the doors here, and they're all greeting you with hugs and kisses on your cheek, and you're like, ah! If you're an introvert, you hate it. You're like, I don't do that. I don't want to hug. Ah!" You know? But after about five minutes, you're like, all right, this is cool, right? Then he says this, to one another without complaint. Be hospitable without complaint. Verse 10, as each of us has received a special gift, watch this, as each of us has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another. Amen? How many of you guys, this is not rhetorical, this is a question I have to ask. How many of you guys have, you're asking God, what are my giftings, Father? Father? 
You guys can raise your hands. I I really want to know, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, I thank you, Holy Spirit, you speak to them right now in the name of Jesus. And that you reveal to them the way you reveal to all of us what their giftings and their callings are. I thank you, God, for the gift of helps, hospitality, all these other giftings that our church needs so that we can move forward as the body of Christ to be the examples to the world. So everyone that raised their hand and even the ones who are afraid to raise your hands, I pray, Father God, that you would reveal to them right now and that they would write it down in their heart and even take a note card out and that they would see you want to use them too, Lord, because you promised them that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? You're going to hear it now in your heart. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. Watch this. Whoever speaks is to do so as one speaking the utterances of God. When we're up here preaching, I'm supposed to make sure I'm speaking the utterances of the Lord. Not my opinion, not conjecture, not emotion. I'm supposed to speak the word of God, right? That's what I'm called to do. And it says whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength of which Christ supplies, where God supplies. Everything we do is by, you ever see, how many of you guys know uh, Vinny Jackson? Who doesn't, right? You, madam, I don't know what you're on, but I need it every day. You serve with a strength of God that only God can supply. You do. I don't think there's something in this church that you're not doing where your hand's not in it. Amen. And it's incredible. Here's another one. Pastor Jan. Have y'all ever been around Pastor Jan? Oh my gosh. She was in this morning and I'm just like going to my office. I got a print and I'm, the printer's not working. And there's Jan. Ping, 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 ping. She's just everywhere. I'm like, how are you doing this? But just her hand is in everything and she knows what's going on. And it's like, how do you? Dale, another one. You serve by the strength what God supplies. Amen? I would say Pastor Todd, but he already knows that. I mean, you serve with the strength that you've been given and you move forward. And Chris, I look at you, Mariah, all of us who serve from a pure heart, do it with the strength that God supplies. Some of you are saying, I don't have the strength. He supplies it. Run to him. He supplies it. We do it because we want to honor the Lord. Amen. I want to honor God. So here, here are three types of people who I've seen while pastoring in churches today. Three types of people. There's reasons why they don't serve. And I'm just going to hit some of them. There are some who can serve, but choose not to. Why? I don't know. What are the reasons? Maybe for some it's pride. I, like I said earlier, you want to lead a Bible study and not lead parking. Maybe there's some pride in you. I've heard it thousands of times. I've already done all those classes. I've already done everything you're offering. I've already done all these things. I just want to be in leadership. My first thing is, then you don't understand the heart of servanthood. You don't. Because what's being asked of you here is a whole different train than where you came from. What you did over there, that's fantastic. That's awesome. Let me ask you a question. What if you had bad doctrine and you don't know it? What if they never taught you how to pray and walk in the spirit? What if you never had an encounter discipleship class? What if you never went through inner healing and you still have wounds in your heart? What if you never been through? So when we're saying do this, we're not saying it to control you. We're saying it so you can be a more effective servant. See? Sometimes it's pride that holds us back. Guys, here's another one. Sometimes it's hurt. I, I, will, I will talk about this for a long time. I know what it's like to hurt. There's some of you who are legitimately hurt and I truly empathize with you. I do. I've been there and I felt, I even wrote it this way, I felt the wrath of man against me. Man. And guys, church folks stink sometimes, man. They could hurt, right? They could hurt you bad. And they can manipulate scripture to try to get you to do things and twist things and get you to hear it this way and make you serve them. Oh my gosh. It's the truth. It can be manipulative and it's scary. And so maybe you're hurt and you're like, I don't want to serve because I'm hurt. But scripture's clear. Ooh. Uh, I'll say it the way I just heard it. 
if you read scripture, you have no reason to be hurt. Here's why. The Bible says you're made more than a conqueror through him who has called you. Okay? Listen. Christians were never meant to lick their own wounds. They were meant to bind up the brokenhearted. Nowhere in scripture does it say to pity yourself. Nowhere. I know we've been hurt. Now you understand what it's like to be Jesus. Hebrews 4 actually says this. We have a high priest who empathizes with our weaknesses. He does. He gets it. If you have an issue of hurt, we're going to pray for you in a second. But I just want you to know, I know what it's like to be hurt by the church. Twelve years I was in a cult. Don't need to go into the story, but it was a full-blown biblical cult. King James only, that kind of thing. It wasn't around here. It was in Minnesota, okay? So I was... (laughs) Sorry, I had to throw that caveat there. But I find that hurt can cause you to shut off and say, Lord, I'm going to blame you. Why did you bring me here, Lord? These were the questions. Why did you, I served you and you led me here and I'm hurt. And he kept telling me, you weren't reading the word. You didn't discern. You saw, but you didn't act on it. He was teaching me things through it all. And you know what that hurt was for? For others who are hurting so we can bind up the brokenhearted. To set them free. Amen. Don't, ooh. Don't allow someone who didn't die for you affect how you serve the one who did. Don't. It's not worth carrying the hurt of someone who doesn't even have a hold of your life and did not save your soul. Jesus saved your soul. Guess what? He promised in this world you will have tribulation. That's a promise. You preached on this a couple weeks ago. Nobody's claiming that promise of, I will be persecuted for his namesake. Yes! Woo! I can't wait, Lord. Let's go preach the gospel. You know what we want? Lord, open their hearts so they don't yell at me, please, Lord. Let's be honest. But your promise hurts, you guys. Your promise you're going to go through it. Why? To look, listen, Romans 8. All things work together for good to those that love God. And I've preached this a hundred times. Watch. And those who are called according to his purpose. Why? For we are created in his workmanship to look like Christ. Verse 29. Those things we go through are supposed to build us to look more like Jesus. Okay? Look it up yourself so when you don't want to serve, read that one. Also, when you're hurt, folks, 1 Corinthians 13. Did you know that love keeps no record of wrongs? (sighs) Has anyone got an oxygen tank? This guy is getting a little thin up here. Love keeps no record of wrongs. If they wronged you, what did he say? Know that if they hate you, they didn't hate you. They hated me before they hated you. It's him they hate, not you. It's him they're offending, not you. If you would realize that you're walking dead and alive in Christ... You don't have room to be offended. You just have room to be Christ. Amen? So let's continue. I've dealt with hurts as much as the next person. I'm just going to tell you a quick story. I remember for about two and a half to three years after leaving that cult, I was wounded, right? I didn't have answers for it. I was frustrated. Some friends came and prayed for me. I got resaved again, you know, like the whole thing. I was going to prayer meetings and the whole thing. And I realized I was so full of wine in my glass, I wasn't emptying it. You know what that wine turned into? Bitterness. A bitter wine stinks. Do you know what that bitter wine tastes like vinegar? You notice that Christ's first miracle was making good wine? His last act was drinking gall and vinegar? That's what sin does in your life. It turns your good wine into vinegar. And you know what happens with vinegar? You begin to be bitter towards one another. You become to become nitpicky towards the church. You become nitpicky towards worship. You become nitpicky towards, and you start to judge people's intentions. They, they, they were doing that because they don't like me. You have no idea if that's why they did it. But we've learned to, instead of empty our, our vessels for him, nothing that sits in a vessel for too long doesn't mold. And if you continue to allow your wine to be sitting in your vessel, it will mold and it will destroy you and any good fruit that you have in your life. 
I promise you. And I find many people are bitter because they've not emptied their vessels for another. And the more you empty your vessel, the more Christ can fill you with new wine. And new wine, and new wine. And as you empty, you get. And as you empty, you give. And then he says, you know what? You've been faithful with that vessel. I'm going to give you a bigger one because you can handle it. So you get bigger vessels. And then your vessel keeps getting empty, and he puts new wine in it. And then he gives you a bigger vessel. And that's why we need 15 acres, because this vessel is getting bigger. Amen? So as we grow into 15 acres, what's your part to play? Where are you called to serve? How many of us say, we don't have time to serve? We don't have time. I love this one. Hold on to your seats. I want to read something from Isaiah about Jesus. Isaiah 53, 3 through 6. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. How many of you guys think that sounds amazing? And one, like one whom men hide their face, he was despised. They didn't even want to know him. Yet we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Here's verse 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Christ, and by his scourging we are healed. He was forsaken, beaten, mocked, turned away. Nobody wanted to know him. And you know what he still did? Went to the cross and died for you for all your sins and iniquities and things you did against him. <laughs> how, dare, how dare we, how dare we hold on to hurts and bitterness when you have the authority within you to say, I can break free from bitterness, and some of us choose not to. That, I'm serious, I love you very much. Please hear my heart in this. That is a slap in the face of the one on the cross. That's a slap in his face because he offers you redemption and you choose not to use it. You choose not to receive it. Get rid of your stuff, man. It ain't worth it. Listen to me. What has bitterness gotten you so far? Nothing except more bitterness and anger. And some of y'all probably wake up with a face that could scare off the demonic, right? For our bitterness. Maybe you need to be on the security team. We don't know. We don't know. Amen? Maybe. <laughs> right? Maybe we just need to get rid of our hurts right now so we can... Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you destroy hurts in this church. I thank you for inner healing and encounter discipleship in those classes to be full for us to receive your glory and goodness in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, we can finally get rid of this bitterness against that person or that thing. Ah, oh, even bitterness against you, Father, for not answering some prayers. That we would understand your sovereignty, Father, and say, no, Lord, you're good anyway. I'm going to serve you no matter what because that's what I signed up for because I love you. And you love me too. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I thank you right now to wash them clean by the blood of Jesus. And if they don't remember this stuff anymore, and they can walk in liberty, liberty to serve in Jesus' name. Amen. Last point. My time. But my time. I ain't got no time to serve. I'm just going to say it like I've heard it. And I know some of you don't. You got newborns, right? Some of you have a lot of kids. Maybe you're Amish. We don't know, right? We don't know. We don't know. But you got a lot of kids, so it's hard to serve when you got a lot of kids. It's hard to serve when you, you know, there's a lot of things. But there are some of you who can serve, and your priorities are just wrong, okay? I'd say this to you. According to Scripture, we were put on this earth to do His will, not our own. My work, my life, my family should glorify the one who died for me. And for us to say we don't have time means we may need a priority shift in our lives. We may need to shift some things to say, you know what? That's not as important as me serving in the kingdom. Amen? Serving for God's purposes. 
one point, if God could stop the moon and the sun for Joshua, what could he do for you? What could he do for you? If you need more time, I'm telling you this, by the spirit of the Lord, I used to pray this, and you've heard it before, for the strength of 10 men and the time to do it. God has overabundantly supplied that for me. The things that I thought would take hours took minutes. God can do those things if you serve him and seek him with your whole heart, amen? So don't let time be your excuse. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't let anything be your excuse. Just serve the Lord and he'll tell you what to do, amen? amen. Open up those windows, Father. The second type of people want to do something for the Lord but can't. It's family or maybe it's your job situation, maybe it's your finances. Listen, I'm going to go through this fast. If you have family and you can't serve and this is where you're at right now, husbands, then serve your family with all your might before the Lord. Learn how to be a servant at home so that when you come here to serve or wherever you serve, you'll understand the method and the mode and the heart of servanthood. Wives, same thing. Learn how to serve at home with your sons and your daughters and your husband, right? When you learn that, you come in here without any kind of reservation. You've learned, hey, I've served well at home. It's time for me to serve in our church. Amen? Sometimes we need that. You want to serve, but you just can't, right? We understand that. And guess what? We still have a spot for you somewhere. <laughs> Number three, last point. I'm just going to go to Hebrews 10. Because I already did this one. But Hebrews 10 says this, and let us consider one to provoke. Listen to this. Let us consider to provoke unto love, right? And to, and to good works. We're supposed to provoke one another to love and to good works. We're supposed to challenge one another and be like, man, why aren't you serving? Why aren't you loving your brother? Why are you walking in bed? You're supposed to love them. We're supposed to prod one another. That's what the word provoke means. Provoking is that little annoying brother. <laughs> you know? We're supposed to provoke one another to do good works and to love one another. Listen, if you're serving and you're not prodding and provoking and recruiting, there's your verse. Start provoking and prodding and recruiting and start getting people on your team. Listen to this. And not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Christ is coming soon. And we want to, we want, look, he comes and he takes us all up. Let him find a servant. Amen. Let him find us doing his will. Amen. That's good. I'll leave you with this. It's the word of God that should provoke you to do what you're called to. It should be the spirit of the Lord that leads you through prayer to do what you're supposed to do. It should be your love for one another that Jesus said should drive us to serve one another. So what are you waiting for? Some of us. I want to see the next time we have something like this, a revivalist thing, I want to see this whole room full of blue shirts. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Listen. Listen. You think you're too old? Psh. Moses' ministry didn't start till he was 80, y'all. Don't even try me with that. Don't even try me with that. Uh-uh. You think you can't physically do it? We'll find something for you, I promise you. There's always something to do for the body, amen? Are you scared to serve? I just want to tell you one verse. He chooses the foolish things of the world to confound those that are wise. I was just telling Pastor Todd this morning in the book of Acts that the people around the disciples, Paul and Peter, them guys, or I'm sorry, James, Peter, all these guys, they said that they perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men, which means they, they, they didn't know anything, they weren't schooled, and they were ignorant. They didn't know the things of the day. But then he said they perceived that they had been with Jesus. That's what made them so wise. Amen? I'm unlearned and ignorant sometimes. But when the Spirit of God hits you, it's like you just become the thing that you're supposed to be in that moment. Maybe you need that spirit of the Lord. So Father, we thank you for that spirit of God on them right now. First Peter four, as we're praying, I'm gonna read this over you. Whoever speaks, remember this, do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.